in that, meaning that, so, that there'll just be a test and that, that they test audiences in terms of responding and, and a lot of the star quality that's applied to, to men will be applied to women and ultimately someone will say, well, I just think this is a prettier woman and we ought to give her a shot in the same way that men get replaced and still do get replaced. There will be a lot of that, but the fact of the matter is, and John Chancellor has a very good statement on this. John night. Chancellor. Well, John Chancellor or right. John Chancellor, <laughs> whichever you prefer. I know, it's a joke, I think. <laughs> but he changed his pronunciation of his last name when he took over the show by himself. Anyway, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. Well, let's make it John Chancellor. You're absolutely right. At any rate, he has this terrific statement where he says that 90% of the time it's like being a preacher and it services as usual. You get up there and you do this, but then 10% of the time you're called upon to give something more of yourself. You can be pretty and read all the words right on television, but when it all goes down and there's no teleprompter and there is no script, you have to draw on whatever it is you do or do not know about the news events of the day. That's where they separated the men from the, the pretty men, from the, from the pretty boys, and the pretty girls from the pretty women. Uh, you can be attractive. Television is visual. It's part of it. It is not the total. It is, it is absolutely not the total thing. What about, what about the difficulty you've had to uh, confront with being attractive and being in intelligent and people not wanting to give you both of those things assuming well a beautiful blonde can't be that smart this is the when did you stop beating your wife question folks <laughs> if i answer this question i de facto i made a de facto admission that i think i'm smart and pretty well i, now, I, if I, no, beg I the think question, you're smart and pretty now if i beg the question then you then then it looks like i'm fishing for compliments no i asked the question i think you're smart and i think you're pretty okay Take now, the what 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 have you had to do? Have you had to work harder to prove your brain? Sure, haven't you? Yes, absolutely. People don't want to give people credit for having a couple of different things. My definition of a person who is thought to be a good talk show host, yeah. a good interviewer, a good journalist, is someone who's not attractive on television because they figure, gee, you know, that person's not too, too attractive. Ergo, that person must be a, a good interviewer. The fact that you're an attractive person and a good interviewer, you have to work twice as hard to prove you're half as good much of the time. And I think that's where there's true equality in yeah. television. I also think that the people who are perceived by other people as being attractive are not walking around perceiving themselves in that same that's way. That's there's true. a big difference there. Let me take a break. We are talking with Jessica Savage about her book. It is called Anchor Woman. We'll be back right after this. Uh, we're back with Jessica Savage. Her book is Anchor Woman, and some of the proceeds of this book go to help other journalists. Is that not correct? Yeah. Uh, as it happens, I'm on the board of trustees of my undergraduate school, Ithaca College, and students have lost their GSA loans. So in addition to figuring it was time to set the record straight on anchor anchor women in this country, I figured it was about time to see if I could figure out how I could earn some money for those worthwhile journalism students well, who've lost their GSA loans. And so that's where part of so the So that's very good of you, I think. Well, I was lucky. I had uh, some breaks. I had a student loan. I had a veteran scholarship. And uh, young people today, worthwhile journalism students, don't have the access to the scholarships mm -hmm. I had. You are not afraid to get personal in the book. Uh, writing here near the end, you say, uh, Let's see. In, in interviews I gave early on in my career, I was quoted as saying it was possible to have it all, a dynamic job, which you have, marriage, which you have had two marriages, which you're no longer married, involved in, and children. But after years of struggling to make it to the top, I began to wonder if it was possible to combine a fully satisfying personal life with a successful career. And I get the impression from reading your, having read your book that you're not so sure that you personally are going to be able to do that. Not that you're obligated to try to do it, but that maybe you're such a hard worker that it can't happen for you. I don't think it's necessarily for me, and I don't think I hold myself forth as the, the, the prototype of what, what a woman's life will be in this industry. But in any industry, for any male or any female, we are in a time of transition. It's a tough time. All the old roles got thrown out the window. And, uh, and we can't be our parents and we have nobody to base our lives on. Can we combine both? The answer I think is some people can combine both successfully some of the time as long as both work hard at it and then some of it is up to the serendipitous winds of chance. Yeah. It is not necessarily a given but the possibility leads me on. The uh I, I conclude the book by thinking that that uh, I don't really know what you really want, though. If you really, if if you're waiting for like a lucky, nice thing to happen mm -hmm. in your life again, or if you're going to just knuckle down and just and really continue to be as relentless in the pursuit of of having a great career as you've already been. 
I don't think that it's mutually exclusive. I think that I can give as much as I would like to give and, and get from my career as much as possible. I do not think that precludes the possibility of a personal life. I think that you must work as hard at both. And then maybe it works out. We were brought up on fairy tales. We all thought we would get a married or become successful and get our ticket stamp validated happily ever after. Happily ever after is a maybe, and it depends a lot on what you put in. I found myself thinking when I was for formulating that I wanted to talk about this, that I, in it's implicit in even asking this question, a certain sexist judgment on my part. I don't know whether or not I would ask a man really the same question. So I would like you to, to maybe analyze a little bit of the thinking that goes into why we somehow seem more concerned as to whether or not a woman can combine a successful career with a personal life than with a man. Because, and I will make this profound statement now, there is a difference. Biology is the answer. If there are to be children for another generation, of the two of us to make this decision, if each of us decided we were going to have children mutually exclusive, one of us would need time off to go to the maternity ward, and it wouldn't be you. But I would want to be there, though. But you would want to be I there. I would want to be there. <laughs> you would want to be there. I want time doing? off, too. I want equal treatment. This is what I, th what I say. No. If there are to be, if there is to be a successful family life and community life, then we have got to make the sociological changes necessary. Uh, yes, the female needs the time off to have the children, but men need the time off to co-parent if both are to work either through desire or economic necessity. There need to be, laws change rapidly, Bill, you know that. Social changes take generations. We are the generation to make the change. I think the institution. I don't think it's a sexist question. I think it's fair. Uh, I think it's a fair question, but I, I did find that there was a, that I was formulating a question for you because you're a woman that I would not necessarily formulate it for a man. I think that the institutions that we work for have to change. I think that there should Absolutely. be an NBC nursery. Absolutely. I'm totally serious about that. I, I'm, I'm perfectly I think serious a woman about or a man right. should be able to bring the children in and there's a place, a, a preschool kind of place, so that you can spend a little time with them. And I don't think we should worry that somebody's not going to be is productive on the job because the child's in the building because I think you'll be a lot more productive if your children are near at hand than if they're halfway across town or an hour up the Hudson Parkway. Let me just tell you, we have our own on the weekend news, executive producer Tom Walzine and Richard Berman and uh, uh, Susan Dutcher and all of us on our weekend news staff, we do that. If someone wants to bring their children in, and crayon on the floor or whatever. Or right on the camera lens. Right, right yes. on the camera. Then bring them in. I find them more productive when we integrate the family element right. than le leave them up there in the bedroom communities in Westchester County or New Jersey or wherever. Right. Well, as I was reading your book, I, I was wondering, as I, as I got to near the end, what you were going to talk about with regard to the, the death of your, your husband who committed suicide. It's a widely known thing. And I'm curious as to why you didn't write more about that. I have a good reason. Long ago and long precluding that event, I decided to draw a line. I felt I, I was doing my job on the public airwaves and therefore I owed a degree of answerability to the public. Who is this person? What is her education? Uh, what is her outlook? What are her views? Mm -hmm. But I drew the line on what is personal. That was a per personal event in my life. It was on record. It happened. Yeah. How I dealt with it, what led up to it, what happened is mine to know, mine to work through, mine to deal with, and mine to explain only where it impacts on my work. I made the decision a long time ago. I've stuck with it, and I continue to stick with it. Do, do you feel that, that you have healed substantially from this? Obviously, you're, you're back at work. I, I'm joy, asking a question based on an empathetical thing. If I had been in a situation like that, I have no idea how I would find my way out of it, probably through doing what I do which is basically through work. At this point, I'm asking this question for people who care about you. How are you with regard to having gone through that trauma last year? I'm obviously still here. I'm obviously still working. Uh, as with anybody who goes through any trauma in life, my, mine is just more visible than others. That's right. Uh, how does the person who's, how does the plumber who has eight children whose wife is, is, is killed in a car wreck, how does he go on? The answer is sometimes he does and sometimes he doesn't. And sometimes he does so in a productive way and sometimes yeah. not so. I find that one of three things happen. You either go on, you go on and you exist, or you prevail. I'm shooting to prevail. Yeah. 
Tell me, tell me what you're going to be shooting uh, with the PBS. You're doing a mm. series. What's it called? Frontline. It's called Frontline. Frontline for PBS. And this is a good thing that NBC let you sort of out of a contract to take a little time off. Well, to do they this. didn't let me out of the contract exactly. I'm still going to be anchoring the Saturday news. I'm going to be combining PBS with NBC. The PBS series uh, airs January 17th at 8 o'clock. It's 26 weeks of excellent documentaries. Uh, it's done under the uh, aegis of David Fanning, who was executive producer of the award-winning series World also did Death of a Princess, uh, and fine staff that some of them worked for Bill Moyers. It's going to be some of the finest investigative reporting. It's not in place of NBC. Mm -hmm. It's something commercial television does not do at this time. I'm in the unique position of being able to work for and with the people in commercial television and in public television. That's I was selected position. for the job, and I am unendingly fortunate about it. Well, I only have a minute or two here. I just want to fire a couple of quick things at you with regard to the business. How long do you think it will be before we'll see a one-hour nightly news on big three networks, if at all? We're going to have to see. I don't know whether it will be one hour straight but I think maybe in prime time. The days of the, the belief that the viewers do not understand that it's something that happens in Iran affects them directly is over. They know that it's going to affect them at the gas pump. Uh, there's more of a need for information. There's more of a need for time to include that information. What is your assessment of, of CNN as it currently is on here in New York? I think that CNN uh, provides a worthwhile service. I think it's still in the process of changing and finding its niche. But what it has done is pointed up the fact that there is a need for more information and the public is ready for it. Yeah. Well, I wish you good luck with your book. I'm very okay. impressed and I hope you continue to do good things in your career. Thank you very Jessica much. Jessica was came to KYW where I worked before I went to North Carolina. So our paths almost crossed. I was <laughs> Well, cross at the party for Anchor Woman, my, right. my book. So there you Fine go. book. I thank you very much for being with us when we return. We have Hilda La Madrid with an interview with Carrie Nye right after this. Feeling.